Hi, I'm Cindy Ma, your host for She Living, and today we are back here in Shanghai, China, where she began. Um, we'll be talking today with two friends of mine who are entrepreneurs in the area of personal care, which is one of my very favorite subjects because as women, we all love our cosmetics. So we'll be talking on personal care to planetary care. So I want to start with um, sort of your, both of your own stories about your companies and how you thought of the brand. I know you both actually come from corporate backgrounds. So maybe you can talk a little bit about, you know, why, why you started your own business and how, um, how you chose, you know, in the end, cost, you know, organic cosmetics. Okay. So Michelle, do you want to start? I start. Okay. Ladies um, first. I have a long story, but I'll try to keep it short. Ever since I was a little kid, I wanted to make people look pretty, <laughs> because I have three sisters, and then at the dinner table, my dad. One day, just they ask us, "What do you want to do when you grow up?" You know, and then I forgot what my sister was uh, was saying, but I remember the reaction from my dad. I said, "I want to be a hairstylist." He's like, "What?" <laughs> you know, back then, hairstylists in Taiwan was not didn't not, did not make very much money, but I always was fascinated by the transformation my mom went through <laughs> before this beauty okay. salon and after she came out. So I was like, oh, this is so cool. So I knew that, and then when I started making, you know, using makeup and all that, and I'm very into, you know, dressing up and all. So I, I knew I wanted to, and I, I wanted to do something to make people look beautiful and make them feel good about themselves. Oh. So, and then, so after I graduated from um, Northwestern University, I went to uh, beauty industry right away. So I worked for one of the biggest direct selling company that sell makeup. Mary Kay, <coughs> yeah. that's it, yeah. Yeah, and, um, and that was another really interesting experience because when I first came here in 1995, you know, here Pudong, yeah, in Shanghai. 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 Yeah. You came in 1995. Wow. Yeah, so um, Pudong was still on farmland, right? So, and uh, I think people were barely coming out of their mouth suit. Yeah. And girls did not know how to take care of themselves. So we did a black and white newspaper ad and say, you know, American cosmetic company seeking beauty consultant with overseas travel opportunities. My goodness, we got over a thousand letters. Mm -hmm. And then we interviewed 200 people until we lost our voice and we picked 20. And then um, eight people qualified after six months. We did serious training. And then we took them to the States. This is the first time Chinese people, you know, Chinese women yeah. went on this big stage of sales convention with 50,000 people and eight people were there. At that time, when we recruited them, they were making $800, uh, 800 RMB per month. Mm -hmm. That's the state-owned enterprise average salary. And one of uh, two of the eight that today were the top, top people in the sales organization, and they're making millions, millions of US dollars per year. In the US? In, in Shanghai. Oh, okay. Yeah, the people that we recruited so and trained. So came to to China through these people yeah. too. So I, so. you know, and then again, not only transform their, their, their outward, you know, yeah. uh, look, but also their, their quality of lifestyle, right? Uh -huh. So these people just wearing Chanel suits, traveling around the country, giving motivational speeches now. Uh -huh. So, and I was very excited that I actually made some difference, you know, um, their, to their life. But I was in the traditional chemical yeah. cosmetic industry. Yeah. Okay. I didn't I didn't know better, right? So I was promoting beauty industry as a as a as a general cosmetic industry. But later I moved to California. I moved to San Francisco working a nat for a natural nutrition company. So I got into health health uh, supplements and um, they they don't use any synthetic flavoring or you know uh, colorings and preservative so I got into, you know, in San Francisco, everybody's so health conscious when I got into, you know, the whole concept of eco lifestyle. And um, I didn't, you know, I had to learn how to recycle because uh -huh. people in Texas never recycle, you know, yeah. at that time. 
So all this, I was absorbing it like a sponge, and I really and that embraced was you, it. And that was when you sort of realized really what Mary Kay was about and what yeah, traditional like, cosmetics well, was like. Yeah, like making them look looking pretty, but not in a healthy way is not good enough. Right. Right. So, but I continued to uh, work in that industry for a uh, natural nutrition company for ten years, and then I moved to China because my husband and and my career, and I decided okay. I want to do something because when we first moved here, to moved here, two thousand six, we both gained so much weight <laughs> because all the Chinese food has all these heavy sauces and That's all the so sugar. That's so interesting. You know, I gained so much because we are swimming, we are working out, we have a uh, well, healthy lifestyle. Well, if you were living in San Francisco, yeah. clearly you're yeah. more Yeah, so when we moved then. here, we both like, you know, really, really fat. So I, and then it was really hard to find organic food. Now you know organic food is everywhere in China, yeah. like at least in the first and second tier city. So back then, I felt like they really didn't have many healthy alternatives, and I want to combine my my passion for beauty and the, you know add the health benefits to it. So I decided to look for brands that I, I admire or I approve of, you know, uh, from different countries. So we work with. Um, brands from New Zealand, Australia, with beautiful abundance of natural ingredients, mm -hmm. and you know, and um, America and France in different different countries. So I, I, I basically want to find the brands that I think are good enough for for the Chinese population right. here. But one of the challenges that that uh, is a very new concept for them. So we will talk about that later. Yes. Yeah, we'll <laughs> yeah. get so, into that. So that's what I how I. Got started. Okay. Mm -hmm. Very inspiring. Sure, Thank you. <laughs> um, uh, obviously, a little different story. Yeah. Um, I grew up in a, in a family that started making organic food and went into <clears throat> organic farming 40 this, years ago. This is in France. This was in France. Yeah. Uh, my France. parents uh, settled a, in a small village uh, on the border with Germany and Switzerland. And God knows that the Germans and the Swiss, they are probably the most advanced in terms of organic, healthy living and quality of life in general. Mm -hmm. So we got influenced in the family very, very early. Uh, and I grew up with organic stuff mm -hmm. uh, without even knowing without that knowing it was special. Yeah. Uh, a lot of the, the people around the family were looking at my parents saying, you know, you kind of you guys hippie or yeah. are you kind of weird? <laughs> uh -huh. uh, but I remember always uh, joining my parents and going to these uh, local farmers where people would actually lay out the, 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 the cotton boxes with the f vegetables fresh out of the garden. Right. And, and that was the way was of life. life. Mm -hmm. yeah. <clears throat> and from there, my parents got really into the alternative medicine yeah. lifestyle. Uh, one of my uncles uh, specialized in iridology, which is a science equivalent to the podoreflexology, where you have a map of the organs in the iris of the eye. Really? And by observing that closely, you can you actually can identify, you can identify like uh, uh, weakness, uh, a little bit in the, the Chinese medicine spirit. Yeah. Uh, you're not, nobody's so going to tell you. Is it a Western you. thing? Or is I don't know if it's Western or oh, not, okay. actually. I've never heard of but it. it's very similar. Yes, yeah, so it's very uh, so similar. So my, my mom used to take us, at your or <laughs> <laughs> take us there <laughs> and to give us this supplement, <coughs> pardon me, in gold, in uh, minerals and metals and so on. So while all the kids at school were actually uh, stuffing themselves with antibiotics, yeah. which I basically never mm -hmm. had, mm -hmm. I was at home getting all these supplements, alternative medicine. Oh, my mom's garden was full of thyme for uh, winter, winter colds and, and essential oils. Mm -hmm. So for us, uh, uh, kind of uh, overeating of chocolate was treated with a, a cup of hot water and two drops of lavender essential oil because that would actually either force the body to digest uh -huh. or would actually create the opposite reaction to actually unload right. the body. It's a form of <laughs> natural detox. Either way, it's detoxing this. Uh, but anyway, so that's, that's me growing up. Uh, totally oblivious to what it was, aware that we were living in a different way than most of mm -hmm. other people, uh, but didn't find that particularly of interest. <coughs> especially as a, teen a teenager growing up. Uh, and then my parents were equally engaged in the social, uh, social area uh, against uh, famine. 
in Africa. Against famine, famine in, Africa. in Africa. So there's this uh, CCFD, Comité Français contre la faim pour le développement, so against uh, famine and for development. And as a kid, I was always joining my parents for all these uh, congresses and uh, social events, and the kids were together. So we were very early on, again, thrown into a, an environment where we were told that while we were stuffing ourselves with uh, black forest yeah. and with cream, yeah. uh, plenty of kids never had enough to eat. Right. Um, and I think it marked uh, very much who I am uh, growing up, but without me realizing yet mm -hmm. what that would do to me later. So I came to China in 94 uh, without knowing why I was coming here, but there was something in me telling yeah. me, you gotta come. Mm -hmm. I remember Pudong at the time, actually, <laughs> there was nothing, there was just a TV tower. <laughs> <clears throat> in fact, uh, and in, in China, this call from within uh, made me discover traditional Chinese medicine. Uh -huh. And I felt like a fish in the ocean here because suddenly, not only I, I could use my essential oils imported from France at the time, but I suddenly discovered a Shanghainese doctor, Yu Daifu, in Beijing, and I spent my life there acupuncture, acupressure massage, uh, the, the smoking, <laughs> oxybustion. Uh, but you weren't, in, you weren't in the healthcare <clears throat> realm. I'm not in the healthcare, but I've always, because of this education, it was always health conscious. Uh -huh. uh, I grew up in a family where each meal is composed to start with by minimum two row vegetable salads. So any, time, any, any meal, you either have fruits for breakfast right. or you have two row salads right. to start. Right. Not at the end of the meal, at the beginning, two. And that goes white cabbage, red cabbage, carrot, uh, radish, wow. uh, like uh, cucumber, tomato, I mean, whatever is seasonal from the garden uh -huh. you get. Um, <coughs> so health was always something very, very important. And but when you came to China, did you see <coughs> the, regular, the rest of the world was not living like that? And, but, and then I came to China. So basically, yeah. on one hand, I was discovering this universe of alternative uh, paradise for me uh, where no need to go to see a traditional uh, western traditional doctor uh, but in the meantime I came to this country where to me everything was to be educated because it came from a certain period of time where basically there was nothing mm -hmm. and there was this eagerness this desire such a strong desire to actually to learn right. to catch up uh, uh, and that's when many, many foreign companies came in and yes. started selling their junk. Yes. Mm -hmm. From health, from medicine, to food, mm -hmm. to name it. Uh, you talk about barely out of the mouth suit. I actually remember Beijing in the early 95, where suddenly over the course of one week, everybody was wearing jeans. Mm -hmm. I, and I don't I, remember seeing so many jeans <coughs> before. I have to admit, my father worked for McDonald's. He is a food scientist. Va dire trop satanas. Yeah, I know. <laughs> don't, don't, don't tell people that. But, uh, <laughs> I'm all about transparency here. I'm here to educate. And I learned from my experience. I also know the other side. But yeah, I mean, there was such a right market for anything. And it still is, I think. And this is the... This is the sort of upstream battle, I think, and this is why it's so hard, not just for the mm -hmm. Chinese people. I mean, I think everywhere it's, it's, it's di more and more difficult to make the, these right dis mm -hmm. choices, um, <clears throat> but especially, especially in China, I think, because, because exactly what you said, they're so young in terms of development. And, and they're suddenly, brand conscious and image very, very conscious. And then suddenly, so. you know, the floodgates opened and everybody right. came in and, and then it was and peer then, pressure. And then it's a peer, peer pressure, yeah. it's about PR. And advertising mm -hmm. yeah the and image. the big money dollars win mm -hmm. um, so just to, to come back and finish the, yeah. the, the story uh, so for the longest time I wanted to educate so I wanted to be a role model because I always believed that you don't tell people what they do wrong you show them how to do it better okay. so all these years <coughs> I tried to in my own way and I'm, it's very small scale to be a model for everybody in my company and at that time it's corporate uh, my friends uh, and so on, but without getting fulfilled by what I was doing. So you were, tell us what you were doing. You were doing... You were I, I'm actually market. a computer science engineer by training. Really? Uh, <laughs> yes, that's a wrong, wrong turn. <laughs> Don't look at it at all, you're a very trendy one. <laughs> exactly, the 
something went wrong somewhere. You call me a very terrible engineer. <laughs> I was not a very too good. A very, a, not a very good one. In <laughs> Let's say I didn't invent anything special. Uh, so <laughs> the, coming into China was also an opportunity for me to actually yeah, change. Right. So it took me about change ten years to go from engineering mm. and <coughs> industrial products into services. Uh, finally, down to the world of luxury. Uh, when we started in early 2000 with my now ex-wife, uh, what I think was at the time the first boutique PR firm focusing exclusively on uh, top-end luxury brands. Mm. Uh, and we did this for quite a few years, quite successfully. And uh, then my lovely daughter was born and I became a daddy. And that basically changed very much. Mm -hmm. Uh, my perception of the world. Mm. So from smoking, drinking, <laughs> partying, I suddenly became a little bit more wise, uh, trying to make better use of my time. And when you have a, a toddler waking up at 5 a.m., you don't go get drunk until 4, 4 a.m. <laughs> uh, or 4.30. Well, Jean, some dads still do that, but I'm glad to hear that you thought otherwise. <laughs> um, but anyway, so that was the beginning of the change. So I started selfishly to say, okay, now what am I going to do mm -hmm. uh, to make sure that this little creature that didn't ask to be here is treated in a way that, well, she will build the same way my parents gave you a great constitution right. Right. and through great health, uh, great food, a great health, in fact, how can I, can I do the same? Knowing that not everything is healthy around China. And without falling into the paranoia, par paranoia <coughs> that everything is bad yeah, right. in China, how do I source, how do I start to identify the better quality? Right. And that set me on a, <coughs> on, a, on a search in Beijing at the time, but then later in Shanghai to where do I find better quality right. vegetable? Where do I find better quality meat? Mm -hmm. Where do I find <laughs> decent fish? Uh, and because I love cooking, well, I got really into it. Uh, and I became a... I don't know uh, how you call this in, in English. I wouldn't sure. It's a sugar daddy for my, my little daughter, but sugar in the in the very sweet. Uh, maybe that's why I abandoned my uh, my wife at the time. Maybe that's why we divorced. <laughs> I actually don't know. It suddenly rings a bell. <coughs> but started to really care and cook for Constance every single meal, and I'm not a big fan of baby food. I believe in giving kids when wow. they, they teach to give them a piece of hard bread and they will chew the bread until their, 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 uh, their gums are soothed uh, with that hard substance. Right. I believe in cooking the food and blending it yeah. and not blending it very early and if you can't eat it then it's not good for you. Uh, so getting into that and then came the, the topic of uh, baby products. Uh, without naming them, there is a big brand out there that sells baby products. Mm -hmm. As And I realized that in China, it is the reference. Mm -hmm. uh, curious about it, because I'm, I have a curious, critical nature. Oil, took the product and turned turn it around yeah. and yeah. said, ooh, this sounds this? strange. What is in this? Uh, it started to, to do some research, which mm -hmm. I've never done for myself. But for her, I, and then I realized that, oops, that mm -hmm. baby oil that's supposed to massage the, the baby is actually petroleum there. Yes. I said, oh, I'm not putting that sticky stuff mm -hmm. onto my baby's skin. So <coughs> one after the other, I started to, uh, to, uh, to consider what can I do next. That coincided with uh, the end of my marriage, uh, the end of my corporate career, because mm -hmm. I was tired of being told what to do, because mm -hmm. I always believed that I knew better. Mm -hmm. So I decided to, be my, to become my own boss and not to, re to answer to anybody. And the question was then, what do I do for the next 20 years of my life? Knowing what I know, knowing that I care for that little girl, knowing that China has given me so much already, uh, so how do I give back? and no longer wishful thinking, uh, I want to do something, but never doing anything. And I said, uh, maybe you should be the change you want to see. Yes. Uh, so I looked at my talents, my abilities. I'm not a designer, I'm terrible with drawing. So I said, design itself is out of the question. Restaurant business is a tough one, and I don't think I had the passion to actually stick to it. So I, I looked and stumbled upon the new concept of a French brand in Paris. And Sally was hit by the fact that why not create in China a China-based concept made in China, designed in China with Chinese ingredients, um, telling a Chinese story. Uh, 
uh, and do it not in a traditional way I've seen it done so far mm -hmm. in the country which is mass low quality cheap everybody gets it but something that's a little bit more sophisticated and, and again telling a, a sincere story and a sincere product and that's basically how after some research and a year of work I created by Inkala yeah. uh, with the intention the true intention to actually one create a good quality product to educate the market as to what is a good product, what is a less, lesser quality product from my perspective. Uh -huh. And finally, to do something that would allow the world to look at one Chinese product, I'm not responsible for the others, but <coughs> to look at one Chinese product and say, not everything is bad in this country. And in, within this country that has a lot of pollution, a lot of issues, social, political, and, and, and name them, you can still go find excellent quality ingredients. You can do a great job. You can produce high quality products. Yeah. Uh, and you can make people proud. I love that. I love that. And I am so, I, from, the, from when I first met you, just your, dedi your dedication to this integrity of high quality really like, strikes me about you and your brand and the fact that it's locally sourced and the fact that you can come up with really a Chinese made product that you are proud of. Hmm. It's, I think it's very rare. So I think it's very It's rare. hard. It, it is. It very is. hard. That's why few people do it. I know. Because I went through that research. I decided not to go that route. It was just way too much work. And I wanted to bring whatever is only available quickly to the market. Mm -hmm. Because I know that it's very hard to find high quality you know, organic ingredients, right? Things like Michelle, that. Michelle, we have talked about this before. <clears throat> um, a lot of people in this in this space talk about um, sort of redefining luxury, right? Mm -hmm. Like not in the terms, you, you know, right. in the corporate world, or <clears throat> you were in luxury branding mm -hmm. before. Um, around, you know, they're so they're <clears throat> so very brand sensitive to worldwide brands or to the, that advertising without looking at, you know, there's a there's a different definition of luxury in the, in the sense that of just like <clears throat> high quality, good quality things. That should be, that should really be the standard for quality. However, I mean, how do you see it? What have you seen in your, in the... We've been talking about redefining luxury for, I think, a couple of years now. Because originally we thought, you know, we talk about eco mm -hmm. lifestyle, they're not there yet in mm -hmm. China, mm -hmm. but they care about quality and safety with all the food right. scandal and product safety scandal. So we realize that safety is number one concern for them, you know, so the safety that also involves quality, right? Right. So we try to educate, educate, educate. That's why starting a new concept, you pay a big price in terms of time and effort. And you have to invest <coughs> a lot of right. resources. We don't have money to do all these big ads, right? And we don't have big PR firm doing you know, all these media relations for us. What we can do is go out and talk to as many, as, and as many people as possible. Big or small events, we try to be there because we have seen the transformation on an individual basis. Mm -hmm. you know, I, I, when I first meet people, I said, what are you using? And they're usually typical brands of you know, Chanel, Dior, and all that. And I said, can you tell me what is the difference between Chanel and Dior, like any luxury brands, they can't, they can't tell me because mm -hmm. they are so identical. The only thing is probably the color of packaging, mm -hmm. you know, the graphic design. If you read the ingredient, they're just so identical. And so they, then they realize that, wow, that's a good question. I said, do you know the difference between our product and those luxury products, no luxury, traditional luxury brands? And then I, when I go through that whole, you know, concept with them, this is, if I have to use a metaphor um, from food, it's like comparing a, a couple instant noodles or a Big Mac to a organic you know, home-cooked meal. Mm -hmm. This is not apple and oranges. It's a completely different thing between a chemical-based you know, cosmetics versus a you know, naturally grown organic ingredients formulated cosmetic. Mm -hmm. So they're day and night, they're different, we have to teach them about it. And yes, we constantly have to deal with the, the mental block of, oh, I've never heard of this brand. Or, you know, but 
uh, you know, big brands and all these, you know, I have to show off my beautiful cosmetic compact that, you know, when I open up, I, I have to show my friends I'm using the most expensive brand. The peer pressure is, also, is still there, but we start to see the, the, the slow, slow progress that we started to see in China. In the past, I would say in the past 18 months, people started to realize that, well, you know, I need to find something that suits me, you know? So we think that anybody over 25 that been using, because actually the Chinese women start using skincare much earlier than Western women. Really? So, yeah. <clears throat> so they start, they really take care of their skin. But did they, do you find that they do it in sort of a more natural way or? No, no, no. They, they, they mean, I mean product. that they start taking, you know, using more cosmetics and more skincare. Mm -hmm. You know, they want whitening, they want sunblock, and they very care about their skin. So at least, you know, from 18, you know, a lot of um, college students are using expensive brands, department store brands. So with so, so little disposable income, they spend a lot on their personal mm -hmm. care. Mm -hmm. Um, but it's very hard to convince the young crowds to go for the natural, for the go for the unknown brand because of the pressure. Is it a price issue? No, no it's a it's pressure. A, it's a, it's it's a, a brand yeah. pressure issue. Yeah. Oh, but my friends are all using right. X, Y, and Z. And then after, you know, we noticed that our target market is actually somebody a little bit older, at, at least 25 and to right. maybe 48. Uh, the reason why we stop at 48, it's not like we don't welcome anybody older, but people who went through cultural revolution or, or more traditional, they don't, they are not into trying new concept as much as the new, the, the younger yeah. crowds. So we, the, the safety is the, you know, a concern. So that's our selling point, the quality of life. People start caring about because before it was about quantity and abundance. Right. Right now is the quality, right? right. So, but there is still image issue. Sure. Yeah. This is this is not a, just a China problem, right? I mean, I, I think, think China is more you know serious. It's a, it's a global it's a global issue. No, it's a global issue. Yeah. This, is, this is another. But it's um, it's just a little bit more sensitive in China because again, coming back to. Uh, the maturity of the consumer when you have less confidence because you have mm -hmm. less experience yeah, overall right. then you tend to be much more influenceable That's by true. media by whatever brand efforts to That's actually true. make you perceive luxury or XYZ brand at a <clears throat> different level so here's the question around that is this sort of like David and Goliath this concept right where the the big brands now I mean they're the the big corporations now have more and more power over advertising. I mean, they're essentially what they're doing is they have a cheap product, right? They can mm -hmm. spend all their money on mm -hmm. advertising, right? And they can lure the sort of innocent, just mm -hmm. like you said, the consumers who don't, are not educated enough. And, and that's what's happened. They're sort of take, take the, they take all the airspace. It's almost a will, monopoly. Right? Yeah. So mm -hmm. it makes your job that much harder to, because you have to spend all of this, inf all this time on education how do you feel about that, about for your own companies that are both sort of startup and nation? And I find that, you know, the typically these these kind of brands, your sorts of companies, I mean, there are all these great startups, mm -hmm. all these people who have had that click like you you did, where you know, you you felt this desire to put yourself forward and your skills and you create it yourself. But do you feel support from the eco community let's say that there's the binding together to kind of you know you can I mean it's not an even playing field really right so how can you how can you compensate for that, that that's your I think I have a nature <coughs> of always <coughs> picking something not easy and I sometimes regret it yes, but so I always the like why can I do this for myself but I'm always looking for the next challenge and I know this is not easy it's not going to be easy for the next five to ten years at least you know, if you look at, um, let's say, Whole Foods, it actually started from my sort of hometown, Austin, Texas, out of all places. And it was started, I was reading the story about Whole Foods because it's a great success story, 1980, 30-something years ago, right? And then they started with a you know, little shop of 19 employees. Mm -hmm. Probably they're counting their dogs, too, <laughs> with the 19 employees. And I saw the picture. I was like, wow, this is 30-something years ago. Yeah. And today... They have 78,000 employees. They're Fortune 232 yeah. in the U.S. 
And the biggest supermarket in New York City is actually Whole Foods. So I so really you believe with that. I really believe that China doesn't need 30 years to get there. Mm -hmm. They probably need 10, maximum 15 years. Because everything China does, they you know, leapfrog everything, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So when they decided to go quality and healthy, I think they can do it. Um, Very much so. And yeah. I believe that we have one, one thing behind us. Uh, which is the very nature of female consumers. Uh -huh. How many times can you buy the same products until you get tired of it? Why? Because you're you're banking on women's. Um, no, because <laughs> because that's what I, that's what I actually new, already new that's products. what I already see. Yeah. Uh, I believe that for for any business uh, like the ones we're engaged uh, in to survive and to actually grow in time, you have to have patience. Then you have to have perseverance yeah. and you have to have to show resilience mm -hmm. because that's the only way you're going to actually survive the test of time that these big corporations are throwing at you. Mm. Uh, once you've done that and then you win clients one after the other. It's not a question of you can't compete with the PR, the advertising mm -hmm. in, in lifestyle magazines because they are occupied by two companies basically. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so you have to, to be there and you have to stand your ground and then you have to do what you do and you have to do it with passion. And sincerity mm -hmm. um, and then you have to be patient really patient and <coughs> convince clients uh, as Michelle was saying going out and talking to people one by one mm -hmm. one by one I did a presentation with I don't know 12 people in the room uh, two weeks ago at key club and um, there are some expats and some Chinese and I showed them a PowerPoint because I basically went to Sephora and take picture of every single label traditional brands and show them and highlight all the bad ingredients and they just amazed you know like for instance um, you know Avino right mm -hmm. yes and they are natural they're, brands yes, right they're totally marketed and then that it's, way and it's, it's, um, it's endorsed by Jennifer Aniston and she has such a healthy you know pure yeah. image and and uh, I want to write her a letter I, I say, know you did should you, I think did you read the all ingredient? the time. it's got four or five different type of parabens like it's got everything that's bad for yeah. you there. And so this is a very typical, what I hate the most is a typical story of they try to be natural, but they're really bad. Mm -hmm. They're like the opposite. It's green they, washing. Yeah. So uh, I think after I show that, I think I, I converted the whole room. Mm -hmm. They just didn't, couldn't believe, you know, because number one, they believe in advertising in China more than any other places. You know, if you're on TV, you must be good. Mm -hmm. So. And number two, they, they believe that government will not allow anything bad, oh right? You know what I mean? Because <laughs> if it's legal, then must be okay. I say, government is selling cigarettes. Yeah. They have a label say, it's, you know, it's smoking smoking you. Kill. Yeah, you can kill, kill yeah. right? But it's up to you whether you want to smoke, right. Right? right? And so I tell them that now EU requires, if you have artificial colorants, you have to say mm -hmm. that you have artificial colorants is actually you know, harmful to health, mm -hmm. but America is not there yet. Because America, Congress, you know, so many lobbyists, right. the regulations actually so much more backwards. Mm -hmm. So I think these are two big hurdles about the trust in the regulatory bodies in China, yeah. because they're, you know, they really, I mean, majority of people believe in the government right. still. And then the second one is the belief in big brands. Yeah. So it is, it's gonna take time. But when I tell them, when we say we go back to defining luxury, right? I try to kind of play towards their desire to be luxurious. I say green is a new luxury. Do you know why? I say, well, you know the, where the rich, you know what, you know what the rich people, the real rich people in London and Japan and New York are using. Yeah. And they're like, what are they using? I said, using brands you never heard of. That's true, actually. You know. So I try to get them to want to have those brands. <laughs> so don't go for mainstream because there are so many other choices. So I try to tell them and brainwash them that yeah. way. <laughs> we come back to, this, to the same topic again, which is experience sophistication. Mm -hmm. I was having a discussion with a, with a lady in uh, Sichuan, but not two weeks ago, about oh. poor tea. Uh, and she believes she's making one of the best poor tea in the, in the country uh -huh. because it's all traditional, it's all uh, hand, uh, handmade, handcrafted. Uh, her tea plantation is all open, you can go video, photo, whatever. 
Well, the factory, mm. another factory which I visited, it's everything is forbidden. You can't look, you can't watch, you can't mm. uh, photography anything mm-hmm. because it's all basically chemical, yeah. uh, altered and so on. And I was having this chat with her saying, but do, do, do you think that Chinese clients are ready <clears throat> to recognize a poor tea that's so expensive because it's actually made the proper way? Right. And she says, it's all a question of time. And she said, the problem with China today, and that's her own words, but I thought was very interesting. She was saying, China believes, wants to believe, and is full to believe that it's already a sophisticated, uh, fully uh, developed developed country. Because everybody who comes tells people, you're sophisticated, therefore you got to buy my brand. Where people are not yet, and that will come soon, but it's not yet. So she's saying, in rich countries, the rich people are slim. Mm -hmm. The poor people tend to be fat and obese. Mm -hmm. In poor countries, the rich people tend to be fat because they want to show that they have money. And the poor people are slim. And she's basically saying, you can't sell everything to everybody. So you have to pick the people in the market who have actually come Mm -hmm. to the stage of realizing that it's no longer for for men or female. That is, you don't show, not showing... uh, wealth and and your understanding of luxury or sophistication by showing how fat you are but by how slender you are which means you already understand so you're eating healthy Mm -hmm. you're using healthy products and then we come to new york paris tokyo (coughs) what do people use in order to be appearing or to experience Mm -hmm. luxury it's about exclusivity it's about niche it's about Mm -hmm. not going mainstream Mm -hmm. which is exactly the opposite of what is happening right here right here right now they're not segmented yet it's not segmented at all it's everybody (laughs) goes for the same Same thing thing. (laughs) and and there's actually a a, a, a coming back to the government thing because everybody's doing it it's got to be safe yeah and that tells you again the insecure there's the the level of security that provides the the comfort of knowing that everybody has the same where uh, for me, I'll do everything I can to look mm. like every possible way different from everybody I know. <laughs> You're doing a good job. Because <laughs> that is my way right? of saying I am yeah. me and I'm, right. uni- I'm unique. Yeah. But it's very different evolution. You have <coughs> the organic movement in, in the States. It started by hippies, right? I mean, the freedom lover, not rich people. Yeah. They really just care about the content and quality of life. Um, but the, you know, here, people who are barely surviving in the bottom, they don't have the money and luxury to worry about the safety and quality, right? So only people who have the means and have enough wealth to start caring about, oh, I want to live longer. You know, now I have money, I need to you know, worry about no, The that. people who are buying products at all, mm-hmm. they already have enough money to be in the game. Mm-hmm. You know, the, it's actually the people who are not in the game, they're, you know they're already healthier because they're using less product. The re- reason why I'm bringing this up is because, you know, coming from the West and coming from healthcare background, um, chronic disease and cancer is a rich man's disease. All of those health issues come from the, pr- the actually, the Process luxury food. lifestyle. The lux the... Traditional luxury lifestyle, actually. Maybe China is a bit different because of all the environmental pollution. If you live closer to the polluted rivers and factories with air, they're just absorbing so much more junk than... Well, yes, you know, that's true. That's know, true. More so probably because here extreme, than, than you know, elsewhere. Right. Um, mm. But what I, what I wanted to bring mm. up with the, that luxury question is, you know, what do we mean by luxury? I mean, luxury should mm. be, like, we should have... This more is happiness, <coughs> yeah. more joy, more health. Isn't time. <coughs> more time. <laughs> time more more the, sleep. <laughs> time is the ultimate luxury, actually. It's the only commodity that you, you really can't trade, and it's limited from the day of your birth. And, and that's why we, we developed a way of life that we believe is actually giving us more time by allowing us to spend less time in the kitchen because we have uh, processed food, com- uh, frozen mm. with the microwave to heat it up. Mm, so uh, we I take see. our car to drive to the drive-in McDonald's, uh, drive-in ATM machine. <clears throat> uh, we take the car to actually go around the corner to buy our bread or our vegetables. Right. We're getting lazy. I, I, I believe that there <clears throat> is a, it's a joke, but there is a conspiracy uh, based on the fact that humans are lazy. And traditional enterprises actually use the, the natural laziness of human beings to actually <laughs> 
it, have them indulge in indulge this them, yeah. modern luxurious lifestyle where in fact they are being fed uh, yes. junk uh, yeah. like uh, muttons or, or stock, livestock in a feeding ground. Uh, sugar, a lot of sugar. Yes. The more sugar, the, the, yeah. the more lazy you get. Mm -hmm. and, and then you're being taught <coughs> in front of your TV or your mobile phone what is luxury. It's not a question of what it is actually, it's a question mm -hmm. of perceived luxury. Mm -hmm. um, that's why I think it's a transformation. Some people have got to that point and then they really, you know, like the light bulb went off because many people I've seen that happens to them before. They, they, after they try some of my product, they say, I can never go back to Chanel again. Mm -hmm. You know, because now they start reading the labels. They start saying, wow, this is interesting. And then they start defining luxury as pampering self, themselves with real good stuff. Yeah. You know, and that because wow. women are very into pampering. But if you go to spa and use all the chemical products, I, I have to use, I have to bring my own massage oil to spa now because I don't trust the oil. <laughs> but you know, if you talk about pampering, a lot of times it's perceived pampering. Hmm. Actually, a lot of things bad for you, putting on yourself or into yourself. Right. So we need to go a, a bit further, you know, deeper. What is really being good to yourself? That to me, that's luxury. Yeah. There is, a, there is a fine line there to define between convenience and, and lazy. What I was going to say <laughs> and is indulgence. <laughs> indulgence and the right thing to do. Right. Knowing that it's very easy, even for the most intelligent and sophisticated person, to actually know what the right thing to do is, but still actually indulge into that bar of chocolate, that ice cream, that uh, glass of wine, that cigar, <clears throat> uh, and that product, because yeah. it smells better. It, it feels better. Uh, a real clean, proper shampoo actually might not leave your hair as shiny and uh, wavy as the big brands make, the, the, make, the make it look. Right. Yeah. Because they add a chemical <clears throat> products to yeah. make it look like this. Right. So, but you're not going to go out looking like you just came out of bed, even, <laughs> even though you do not. Uh, so are we, are we going to do the right thing? As a, as a society, you know, I'm talking yeah. not about individual, yeah. but or are we just going to keep on indulging? My feeling is that we're losing the battle. We are losing the battle against big corporations I because they are getting more and more powerful and they have more and more means. And the population, general population, spends more and more time in front of its TV and reading uh, advertising or <coughs> watching. Because it's no longer a, a world where we read. The time of reading is over. Whatever that's going to bring to the human race, I don't know. But the time of reading is, is gone. People don't want to read. The mass wants to watch pictures, moving, video. Yeah. News. Only that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The, the, the good writing. Left. There's still good media left. <laughs> 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 Try to make good media but the, left. the battle is going to change a battlefield now. We're going to change from the, 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 uh, the substance of things to, the, again, the appearance. Because... Yeah. The, the laziness and again it's about the indulgence of not making any effort to yeah. to get anything people want to get the best without moving an, 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 a finger now you have the, the whatever xyz <laughs> well no? that's why i think it's a balancing ongoing balancing every day you make choices right and then i try to take a practical approach because i don't i can't preach pe to people sometimes we all have to you know sacrifice something to get convenience or we sacrifice certain things to get the help, right? So I try to be practical about it and say, you can be green and gorgeous. Mm -hmm. You don't have to sacrifice results because you are using less known brands, right? So, and, and I think that's a, that's a mindset we have to keep, you know, pounding on, on them. But um, I don't want to take them too extreme and say, you know, if you're doing this, this is, this is yeah. terrible. So I, I think <clears throat> um, I actually I have I have I have hope. I, I, <laughs> I intend, well. I it's not that I don't understand the severity of what's happening, but I do have faith that what you're saying is when you get to the point of this laziness, you know, where you, everything is media. I feel like <clears throat> somewhere instinctively in people, you it, at some point you get that feeling like. I gotta stop doing this. Or you, you feel like like you a very <laughs> small minority. I agree with him though because well, the young people now is all about instant gratification. Hmm. 
you you know this is a this is a journey right and that part and you you've been through it yourself in your own life path to to the point where you get to that wisdom of realizing oh i shouldn't party so much or i shouldn't there's like you get you start getting negative effects in your health i mean for some people this comes after some very severe, you know, sort of Diseases. crisis, yeah. either mm -hmm. a health crisis right. or you have a mental crisis or you or got you pregnant, you start your, or having children, you really start. hate your mm -hmm. job or you just sort of feel the weight of the soullessness mm -hmm. of your life. That is the, and people have different extremes, right? And, and different kind of um, levers to when that pushes you to change that pushes you to go in a different direction against the laziness there there is that sort of personal fight going on i think for i mean i would hope for everybody but not clearly not everybody many people give up many actually people some give people up some people have that that uh, wisdom call at a certain point in their life right. where they, they change or they become aware and they do something about it but i also see a lot of people next to me and i, I take for, for for example facebook Yeah. Where I see my uh, university or business school uh, <laughs> colleagues, some of them I feel like, oh my God, what happened to you? Like you just accelerate time, and uh, you look 20 years older than me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, I take good care of myself. I right. eat properly, but I see some people there mm -hmm. got suddenly boom, yeah. well, got fat, and, like, and then they, they don't take care. And, and to me, it's mm -hmm. I, I really try to understand why. Mm -hmm. And actually, they give up. They've basically peaked. They don't want to make any more effort to stay they, young, eat healthy. They, they just know. want an easy I would life. Say they they want don't know how. I mean, that's what. Or you know, you then you get into this, this rut. environment. You get into this in. rut, yeah. and everybody around you is doing those same things, and that's why you said what you just said before, which is that you wanted to be, you know, a model for mm -hmm. a different way. And your friends can see what is. Why does Jean look so young? Yeah, what is, what is what's, he his what's his that, problem? Yeah, no, what, it could like, be what's your problem or what's your, <coughs> or what's your secret, right? That's what, that's what you hope to get to. It's the curiosity. What's your secret? How can I, how can I do that? Can I do that or mm -hmm. forget about it in my life? But again, it's like real, I go back to what I said earlier, re resilience. Uh, are you going to just eat what you're being fed or are you going to question at a certain point? Um, and I think that also if determined by your background and as we, you just said, the environment, society, what kind of school, friends, environment do you choose to, to live in? Uh, and so we, 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 we are actually and, and eventually we're free individuals, whether we live in a totally free, apparently free, obviously free society, we're still free citizens and with the, the freedom that Uh, internet gave us uh, a decade ago or a little bit more uh, we have the power now to inform ourselves more than ever I know information's there mm -hmm. yet I feel that with that, that that mountain that universe of knowledge that at your fingertips people are just using less and less yeah. it's right. hard to decipher yeah. through, it's hard to weed through all of the crap to get to the but the you gems, talk about the right? support from the eco effort. community right the eco community that can actually work together, that we all, you know, small, right? So if we work together and use either social media or internet, whatever platforms or the video, you know, whatever problem we can find to kind of really utilize what we have yeah. and, and make bigger noise. I right. think we can do it. Right. We can and there it. is, and that's, I mean, I hope to participate in that mm -hmm. also with this. But, and there are groups that are, you know, the, the activists, the advocates that are using social media and the internet for, you know, to organize and to, to bring positive action. And that's, those are subjects that I want to, that I want to talk about also. Mm -hmm. um, I, to, to your point about, um, you know, getting, getting people out, out of this rut is that there, that there needs to be more sort of disruptors, mm -hmm. right? Like people External not force. Do, yeah. yeah. And uh, intervention, <laughs> <laughs> a, a dissonant voice yes. that's actually singing wrong that, in the middle of the beautiful that's symphony right. that's that being sung. That makes you sort of stop and think, yeah. hey. It's scratching the disc that suddenly yeah. goes, and people stop and lift their head and say, what was that? Yeah. Hmm. And this is, um, this goes to my, my question about sort of, um, you know, what's happening with the world on a you know, planetary level. And your mm. role, I don't know if you got to look at the video that I sent, but it's one of um, 
it's one of my sort of new favorite of it's an author and a speaker called Charles Eisenstein. Mm, I couldn't he, download it. Yeah. Me neither. It's good blocked. I know because we're <laughs> probably China. blocked. It's okay. blocked. <laughs> Hopefully we'll get that to you somehow. We can mm. get it to you. But he um, he's was talking about a new story of the people, basically centered around um, exactly that. What can I do as an individual to affect mm. all of you know what you see around is sometimes paralyzing. Right, or you get sort of sort of down on, you know, it's the problem seems so big, but uh, his message was really around, um, you know, if you can be that disruptor, then you will your little impact will grow and it will create ripples and it will, will create waves that that will resonate out mm. just from just from what you're doing and you are both doing that through your through your brands. I mean, that's a that's a great thing. It's a great step. Um, the other, the other point that he brought out was of being in service to something greater than yourself. And you spoke to that when you when you came up with uh, my uncle mm -hmm. on just sort of the importance of your daughter, and you wanted to leave something that you felt, you know, that you felt from your heart was <clears throat> authentic and took sort of the best use of all of your life experience to bring to that. Um, that's what we're hoping more and more people will do. And I wanted to ask you guys, you know, do you feel that you are, what is the service that you are bringing? Not, not in terms of your business, but in terms of your life. Like, what are the gifts <laughs> that, and do you feel like, you, do you feel grounded in that? Do you feel that that gives you sort of satisfaction that you are, living sort always. of true to yourself. I always get so excited when I convert one customer from, you know, bad cosmetic to good cosmetic. I just do, do changing one <laughs> face at a time. I like oh, 1.3 billion faces to change. One but, lotion at a time, but, you're but, making a difference. Yeah, I agree with you, we need patience in this mm. business, but I'm not a very patient person. That's the problem, <laughs> that's why I'm always stressed about it. And I wish it was faster. Yeah. I wish the more people do it. You know, I wouldn't really welcome competition for natural and organic good stuff coming into China mm -hmm. or, you know, forming in China. We need more of these. Mm -hmm. Talking about the same thing, educating, you know, yeah. and hopefully, if you think about seven billion people, hopefully they take shower every day <laughs> and then they are all using artificial surfactant. They're all going to the pipes, going to the drain, going to the river, going to the ocean and polluting the, our fish right. in the ocean. And and the artificial, you know, chemical sunscreen. There's a university study, University of Bologna in um, Italy, in 2012. They there, three the three thousand tons of sunblock chemical mm -hmm. going to the ocean, yeah. bleaching our corals. Yeah. I mean, the personal and choices we make every day impact is is a circle. It comes back to you. Yeah. Right. So <coughs> the education on this is really important. And the other bit is the sunblock, you know, mo mothers who use that for their babies, they use it like so from this, from this place of fear, right? There is, a, there is a fear force working in favor of the developers or the corporates or, that are driving this demand, right? It's all about, well, that's gonna be bad for you. It, the, we need more sort of empowerment of the person, like you said of you know feeling like you you have all this available to you wisdom available and you've got to kind of take it you got to like step up and 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 participate right in a more active way you talking about disruptor i think the closest i can see so far in china is the the the, the terrible air last year sorry, mm. last year yeah. right yesterday <laughs> but yeah you might like the past few months it just got Especially so bad in shanghai yeah. And never before the local Chinese complained so much about it. Before it was an expat, you know, we're not used to it. Now the local Chinese can't handle it themselves either. Yeah. So I think they started to feel like there's a need to talk about environmental. Before it's all slogan by the government. Mm -hmm. It's not a living principle. It's Huan Bao. Huan Bao is a mm -hmm. slogan. Yeah. But now it's something they start thinking about because you have to breathe. <laughs> you know, you can't avoid it. So I think that's a good... Actually, it's a good disruptor. They start realizing this is something that is really impacting everybody. Well, the, the thing is that most people think it's an external thing, that I don't have anything to do with that. 
that's the that's the part we have to bring back to everybody everybody has you you have you know you have some power to stop things it's Even, it's what i call co corporate uh, corporate uh, no not corporate citizen responsibility uh -huh. this world is ours and that's what i think people tend to forget mm -hmm. we, we talked earlier about the fact that humans rely on their governments mm -hmm. to actually make decisions for them yeah. The world is not the government's world, it's our world, the air is mm. ours. So it's our responsibility as consumers, as humans, as, as inhabitants of, too, of as Earth to actually, to actually just... do what is right to do. Because we, every, every decision we take, everything we do or don't has in fact an impact on the environment. I was in, uh, in Yunnan two weeks ago and visited the, uh, the, the Hani minority uh, rice terrace. Uh, <coughs> and stayed in a guest house that's really on the edge of the rice fields. I had a very inter interesting discussion with the owner of the, the first guest house there in Yuan Yang, uh, old lady, 60s from Guangzhou. And in the course of the, of the discussion, I was saying, but do you have any water recycling facility? Because all the village is basically taking a, f a shower every day. The water is basically running down the rice paddies and oh, that ends up in the mm. rice that right. these people are eating and, and looking <laughs> and looking oh. looking at the at the development of yeah. tourism here i say if nothing is being done are you aware that the more guests you're going to receive the more you're going to destroy that treasure you have in your in, in your hands and she was actually saying that she went all the way to the border between Guangdong and Hunan to actually get a natural uh, extract of... <coughs> um, it's, it's the sub the byproduct of making alcohol. Mm -hmm. uh, and the leftover is not being used. And she, if you ferment it, it actually turns into a natural foaming agent. Oh. So she went, she brought it back. And she wants to um, to turn it into a standard shower and uh, mm -hmm. hair care mm -hmm. to actually be released in in the fields, but having no chemical agent as a pure natural product. Uh, so I decided to actually offer her individual bottle packaging, saying, "Tell your clients not to come with their shampoo conditioner, or at least not to use it anymore." Uh, I'll sponsor all your yearly uh, consumption of individual small bottles, so that we do something about it. Uh, you ask whether we're proud of what we do or if it uh, makes us feel good. Uh, sometimes it, it, it's a downhill uh, battle. It actually brings you down because the regulate, regu regulatory, uh, the consumer behavior, the, the disbelief, the, the, the brand uh, hits you take from, from the big uh, brands. But once in a while, there's a story of someone inspired uh, that thinks the way you think, that actually empowers you to do something, whatever big or small. Mm -hmm. And that just revives the flame and says, this is what I'm doing it. And this is what I got to keep on doing. And despite all the hits and all the resistance you, <coughs> you feel in the market every day, it's just keep going. Yeah, we don't like it easy. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's good because it's still an uphill battle and we need everybody... Everybody on board. So one of the things that we want to do with this show is to encourage people, to inspire them to some action. Um, we want people to make pledges to, to change something about their, their lives. And so what, what would that pledge be for you? What would you like people to pledge to on this show? I would, I would say the first step in the direction of change that I would recommend is for people to stop buying blindly. Whenever, whenever you buy any processed product or something that looks natural, take the product and turn it around. Take 30 seconds and look at the label. Look at what you're eating, look at what you're putting on your, on your face, look at what you're drinking and, and, and take that 30 seconds. It's not going to change your life. Uh, it's not going to make waste your time, but it might actually change your life and it might help change the world. Um, there are so many things I want them to do, but um, I would like them to consciously actually quantify the garbage they throw out every day. It's pretty scary, actually. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You it know, is. because you know everybody's looking for the airplane, right? The MH370. And one of the comments is totally unrelated, but one of the comments by the, 
the the aviation expert said that, or I, I forgot the ocean expert because they're deep, you know, going down to look for it. It's like you know what everything that's made of plastic mm -hmm. since its formation is still in the ocean. Right. So there's so much junk and debris that you have to, you know, go through to find anything that can possibly be from that plane. So when he said that, I said like, it's true. Everything that made of plastic, you know, 50 years ago, still there. So why doesn't it, the government, yeah, any government, yeah. just ban it? You know. And then so the cool. fact that the recycling is still done by the poor little, you know, ladies, you know, dragging the tricycle around the street. I really want to see people start paying attention to how much stuff they are now recycling, they're, they're you know, wasting. But both of you, what you're saying is both of you are saying the first step, in which we know the first step towards change is sort of you first, you know, bring awareness to yourself. Just And that's the same sort of, same thing for meditation practice, right? The first step is, you know, bring awareness. <clears throat> okay.